What was the portrayal? I was called into a room one night. It was over money, and uh, there was an article that came out in, in a, a Long Island newspaper. I think it was a Long Island press out of circulation now that said I was becoming powerful enough to take over, to stop my own family, break away from the Columbo, stop my own family. No truth in it whatsoever. Some reporter just made it up because I was doing well. I had a jet plane, a helicopter, big crew. I was in the media. What was I, your net worth, and how old were you? I was... Uh, well, when I walked away from that life, I was 34. This was, I was around 30 at that point, 29, 30. Do you know what your net worth was? I have no idea because I had a lot of cash. Mm -hmm. you know? It was in the millions for sure. It was a lot of money. And then it was saying that I, that I had defrauded the government at $2 billion. It wasn't $2 billion. It was a lot of money. But, you know, they always, they always exaggerate. So now guys on the street are starting to get a little... Two billion dollars, his own family. I had the Russians. I had organized the Russians with me. We had a very strong crew and a lot of guys around me. So I think to, they walked me into that room one night and my father was in there before me. And I mean, I could, this story can take an hour, so I don't want to hold you up with it. But um, the bottom line is I, I, I talked my sense into them and said, basically, I'm bringing you all this money and I'm being put on the spot for this. I said, I'm taking all the risk. Nobody else is in jeopardy here. These are my guys. Nobody knows who you are. I purposely kept my guys away from them so that if my thing ever blew up, we wouldn't be hurting any of the guys in the family. And I said, and now I'm being questioned? I said, they write an article about me, all of a sudden it's true. They write about everybody else, it's false. So... I started to get angry with the boss. You don't do that. You know, you know, the, the, you never outshine the master. You know that principle and that life for sure. So I calmed myself down. I said, okay, I'm walking out of here. Everything's going to be all right. And then we finished up and, you know, we have a glass of wine. Everything's great. You know, the usual thing. And then it wasn't until I got in the car with the guy that drove me there, who I knew my whole life. He was a captain along with me. And I got in the car and I got very upset with him. I said, you knew, you didn't tell me what was happening here tonight. I'm walking into a trap and you don't prepare me. You don't say anything to me. You know what he said, Steve? He looked at me and he said, if it was the other way around, would you have told me? And I, I said, you smart guy. And I said, no. I said, Michael, you know the life as well as anybody. You grew up around the best. I said, okay. I get out of the, I go to get out of the car and he grabs my hand, my arm, and he says, I'm going to tell you something. You're not going to want to hear this, but it's the truth. I am your friend. He said, we live by a certain code, but I am your friend. I said, what? Your father was in there before you tonight. He didn't help you one bit. He hurt you in there tonight. And I was like devastated. I said, what do you mean? And I said it to myself. I didn't ask him. I couldn't even answer him. I, I, was starting, I got out of the car and was walking towards my car, and I started to think, knowing my father so well, I said, I know what he did. Hey, my son is stealing. He does everything. I'm on parole. I don't know what he's doing. I have no idea. He just kind of took the high road and left me on my own instead of standing up for me because we were both captains at that point. My dad could have forcefully said, how dare you? My son would never rob me. He could have really came out, but he didn't. I was really on my own. And I could have been dangerous. You know, again, the traps that they set up for you during that time, because believe me, they would have loved to take over my business and just, you know, and you got to watch for that. So the traps that were set up, you know, fortunately I was able to navigate them, but uh, it really was devastating because I said, how? How could that happen? And you were running multiple businesses at that point, not just the, the fuel business? No, I had, I had uh, well, you know, I had legitimate business. I had two uh, automobile agencies. I had a Mazda dealership, very successful. I had a Chevrolet dealership, successful. I had a leasing company. I had a film production company at that time. I was making movies. I made about 30 films during that time, all uh, horror exploitation films. They were big at that point. I had a number of restaurants that I was involved in. Um, I had a video shop and video, you know, cassettes and everything were big. It didn't compete with Blockbuster, but we had a good neighborhood spot, you know. So I had a lot of things going on. I had a lot of money on the street. I was lending money out to, uh, to a lot of my own guys. I'd lend it to them. They, in turn, would lend it to somebody else. You know, so, I mean, I had, I had, I had a lot going on. And did you have to pay a tax to the mafia for earning money? Did you have to then pay the mafia some of that money? If it was illegitimate, yes. Okay, so if it's legal, no. If it's legal, no. Unless they contributed in some way, and they didn't. My dealerships were mine. I didn't owe them anything. 
You know, my, my film company was mine. Uh, but anything I had on the street, yes, you have to pay up. How did being part of the mafia help you in business? Could you just, you told me the gas station story. I imagine you weren't strong arming your way all the time into business. Or were yeah, you? Didn't have to strong arm, you know. Uh, listen, the Mazda agencies that I got, people knew who I was. You know, I was going broke. I didn't have any money. I was on trial a couple, I was broke. But I told the guy, I said, listen, I understand the business. I'm very aggressive. Give me the, give me the place. You know who my father is, you know. Ah, oh, you got it. I'm going broke. So he gave me the dealership, basically. And then through a series of things, I was able to get floor planning. I mean, it was a whole stuff. I worked hard, Steve. I was a seven-day-a-week working guy. Worked hard. I kind of understood certain things, like, you know, I, right away. There was a guy in General Electric Credit, you know. I went to him. I knew he kind of was fascinated with the life. And I said to him, look, I need a floor plan for my cars. I don't have any money. I said, I need a couple hundred thousand dollars. I got to be able to buy cars from Mazda. I said, I'll give you so much your car. I said, you floor plan me. I'll play it straight with you. Every car I sell, I'll give you a couple hundred bucks. He was in troll. He floor planned me. That's how I got the floor plan. What's the floor plan? Floor plan is financing to buy the cars from, from the uh, manufacturer so you can put them on your yacht. Oh, okay. Just that they, yeah, they don't give you sure. credit. You got to buy them. When does it all come crashing down for you? <laughs> well, came crashing down really. Like I, I had went to trial five times and is either dismissed or acquitted in every case. I beat him five times. But it came crashing down in the gasoline tax case. My partner, who he and I developed this scheme together, he was really the brains of it. I was the polish. I knew how to do certain things that he couldn't do, but he came up with a scheme. I brought the accountant in, I brought a certain strategy in, I brought people to the table, and I made sure nobody messed up and we got the right money. I was, I was the expansion part of the business, you know? And um, he became an informant. He got in trouble on an unrelated case, and uh, they told him, listen, you're going to jail forever unless you give us Michael. And that's when it started to come down on me. I took a plea to the gasoline case even though he had testified against me in a prior case and I was acquitted. We destroyed him on the stand. He wasn't a good witness. But part of my strategy, I'll take a plea, I'll marry, I knew my wife at that point, I'm gonna marry this girl, I'll get a lower sentence by taking a plea, I'll give the government back some money, I gave up my plane, my helicopter, the whole bit, take it, forfeitures. I had five million in forfeitures and 15 million in restitution I had to pay them. So um, it was part of my strategy to take a plea do some time, give them some money, move out to the West Coast to marry this girl and then try to get out of life. It's part of my strategy, really. How do you feel about him? You know, I'm gonna tell you God's honest truth. Um, he was six, six foot four, almost six five, 450 pounds, big guy. He wasn't a sloppy fat, he was a big guy, right? We were together seven, eight years, never had an argument. His kids called me Uncle Michael. I was married before for a, a short time, and my young kids called him Uncle Larry. We made millions together. But I knew he was weak. I knew if he ever got in trouble. And um, look, when he got in trouble, they said to me, we'll take care of him for you. And I said, listen, I'm gonna fight him. His wife, I know his family, I can't do it. I said, just, I'll fight him in court. They were upset with me for making that decision, and that was my decision. I said, I'll fight him in court. And um, that's what happened. How do you feel about him? It's almost like I couldn't even be really upset with him because we, we got along so well. We made so much money. I just knew he was weak. So, you know, I learned one thing, Steve. I, I try not to put the blame on anybody else. Anything that goes wrong, I take responsibility for personally. I should have known better. Even if some guy does me wrong, why didn't I figure that out? Why didn't I know this? I always try to take responsibility so I don't make the same mistake again. It's worked for me my whole life. When you start playing a blame game and start, all it does, it's, it's a sign of weakness in my view. And you know, if you accept responsibility for everything, even when it really isn't your fault, and you say, I should have known better, come on. Uh, how did I do this? Why did I let this guy get it, take advantage of me like this? You know. Until right now, I have a situation now, I'm saying the same thing. My fault, you know, what am I gonna do, get mad, you know? So, you know, it's just the way I operate. So 
Was I really upset with him? Like, you know, no. When you say you knew he was weak, how are you defining weakness and strength? I knew if he got in trouble, he wouldn't stand up. He would cooperate. He didn't want to go to prison. He, was, he wasn't a guy that was going to do jail time. I knew that. And, uh, and my other guy, you know, one of the things is my boss always wanted to meet him. And I said, I'm not going to make, now I know why they wanted to meet him. You know, in case of anything, they would take him away from me, right? I said, I'm not going to make you meet him because he's weak. If we ever get, he, he's going to give up everybody. So why would I make him meet you? And then you're going to blame me for introducing him to you. Strategy, right? They couldn't say no to that. They couldn't say no. And I said it in front of people. I said, I'm telling you, this guy is not going to stand up. When I have a problem, he's my problem. I'll take care of it my way. But I'm not going to introduce him to people that he can put in trouble. No way. And they couldn't argue with that. It was part of my strategy. So when he snitched effectively, mm -hmm. did they not want to take care of him? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. They said, we'll handle it for you. You know, turn us, you know, let us know. You know they, wanted him, they wanted him out of the picture. So they didn't want this to end. Because they figured it, if he's gone, I can still keep this going. How, how easy was that for them to order someone's murder? Because they, it sounds so matter of fact, like, oh, we'll take care of this. The boss had total, uh, how hard was it for the boss to order a murder and then have it executed? Yeah. Wasn't hard at all. It was not hard at all. Especially it was with somebody within our life. It wasn't hard, unfortunately. So the boss could just say, take care of him and then someone would go and do it? Absolutely. No questions asked? Boss at that point say, he's going to go. They need to sign it to somebody and then it's up to them how they handle it. What if they didn't handle it? They'd be in trouble. They've got to handle it. Was there ever an instance you can recall where someone didn't handle it? Well, it could have been an aborted attempt. And if it was a legitimately aborted attempt, um, you know, you, you, you're normally not going to be held responsible for that. But if you're given a job, you better get it done. Let's put it that way. Or you're going to be responsible. In some ways, yes, you could be. Especially if that person goes on to do something hurtful to everybody else. Eventually, you do get sent to prison. You take a plea deal. Yeah. What's your plea deal? I pled to, uh, it was a racketeering case. The underlying act was uh, tax fraud. Mm -hmm. And um, two counts that I pled guilty to, racketeering, conspiracy, something. And 10-year prison sentence, $14.7 million, $14 million in restitution, $5 million in forfeitures. And, um, Did that and leave I'm, you with any money? Well, yes. Because in negotiating the plea, I was able to keep certain things and not. I said, listen, if I'm going to take a plea, my wife's not going to go to work. I'm going to make sure my wife, my kid, they're all okay. So I'm going to keep some of the money. You know, so uh, when you're negotiating a plea, my lawyer, he was able to at least give me enough. My wife never had to go to work when I was in jail. Do they, I was wondering this because a lot of the things you describe sound like they were done in cash. A lot of cash, no question. Um, but there was a lot of wire transfers and money sent in different places. We had a lot. Because not everybody paid. In, and you were selling to legitimate gas station owners. You know, they didn't pay you in cash all the time. And especially when you're selling big volume, there was a lot of wire transfers, a lot of wire activity. If you love the Diary of a CEO brand and you watch this channel, please do me a huge favor become part of the 15% of the viewers on this channel that have hit the subscribe button. It helps us tremendously and the bigger the channel gets, the bigger the guests.